What is up guys, welcome back to another very special seed to harvest. Grab your joints, your bongs, and a drink and let's get freaking lit. Now for those of you new to the channel, welcome to the ICANN TAC channel, where our goal is to help all growers all over the world perfect their craft, learn different tricks, and maximize their final quality, yield, and end product. It doesn't matter if you're in soil, cocoa, or water. It doesn't matter if you're a small budget setup grower or in a full 5x5 setup. Our aim is to help you improve. On this channel, we make all the mistakes so that you don't have to. We test all the new tools and equipment and give you the honest truths. We bust myths, talk bro science techniques, and of course, help you grow beautiful plants. We upload videos a few times a week, so be sure to subscribe and hit that bell so that you don't miss our upload. In today's episode, it's a triple banger, boys. You'll be going from seed to harvest with two different strains, and these aren't just any old strains. We've got some serious fire hair, lads, so better circle up and let's get into it. Now, I've been medicating for years and fortunate enough to sample flowers from all over the world. Amsterdam, New York, England, Miami, Spain, Italy, France, and of course Canada. But that said, I still mostly found myself always having to hide from the Federalis. Oh, no, they're, they're bringing him. They're, they're moving up. Safety first. Can't get caught by the feds, dude and well, everyone in general, because you know. Weird orgies, wild parties, roots in hell. A helpless addict of its victim within weeks, causing physical and moral ruin and death. Let's go Jack, I'm red hot. Every reaper is loaded with immorality and beast of perversion, brutality, murder, sex crimes, insanity or suicide. Bruh. Uh, yeah. So, isn't that crazy? Anyway, so when the laws changed in my hometown, I literally took the chance to grow my own. There was no dispensary in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a little island in the Caribbean, so getting premium flour was expensive. Bricks were and are to this day super, super common. We call it creepy or color. Cause that shit will creep up on you fam. So this is about an ounce, I would say maybe just over an ounce in this little brick right here maybe. Now don't get me wrong, Trinidad has some of the most beautiful land race strains. So much so, strain hunters actually visited us down there and you definitely should too. 2011, uh, we decided to do two expeditions in two countries, one Trinidad and one St. Vincent in the Grenadines. Damn, it's genius. We need seeds from this yeah. later. Yeah. We need the seeds from this plant, man. Absolutely. But all that said, when I first started growing, I just didn't have access to premium quality genetics. I grew a few bag seeds, some from brickweed that turned out okay, not the best at all, and I grew some from some premium flour that turned out a lot better, but still, you know, I, I wanted to get some quality fire genetics. Because bag seeds are cool and everything, but after having spoken with some friends who were also growers and done some research, Seedsman came in highly recommended as the go-to seed bank. They were around for like a decade, so I hopped onto my laptop to see what's up. I didn't take me long to find their super wide variety of breeders and strains that Seedman had, so with that I knew I had to take a deeper dive into some solid genetics. Fast Buds, Mephisto, Humboldt, QRS, like where do I even start? There were so many breeders and I wanted to try them all. But if I'm being completely honest, one of the breeders that was at the top of my list was in-house genetics. So I started a search for some of their strains. Now guys, I heard and seen some crazy things about in-house genetics just being absolute frost monsters. Lots of people who grew them said that they may not always produce the hugest yield, but the quality is top notch. 
a literal quality over quantity type situation. Of course, I wanted to be the judge of that. Plus, with crazy names like platinum garlic, frozen grapes, and slurricane, like who wouldn't? So now that we're settled on what cultivar we're gonna run, the only question before me at this point was, what strains do I choose? So many strains, so little space to grow. I'm sure all of you had that problem at least once. Now after much deliberation, many doobies, and even a few dabs, we settled on the sugarcane and dirty kush breath. Of course we grabbed a few extras as well, but we're still yet to run any of those. The sugarcane was personally always on my list. It was actually the strain that turned my head, literally, and put me on to in-house genetics. The picture I saw of this strain was an absolute frost beast of a phenotype probably still some of the frostiest flower I've seen in my life. Sugarcane is a strain which combines two heavy resin producers, platinum and slurricane. According to the breeder's official description, it's a must for any extractors looking for huge returns. Perfect. Now the Dirty Kush Breath on the other hand ticked loads of boxes for me. Not only did the name sound super freaking cool and immediately make me want to smoke some, but according to the breeder information, it's a fantastic offering from the in-house genetics line based on crossing Dirty Banana with OG KB V2.1. She's a heavy hitter, great for pain and relaxation. I can enjoy the banana chirps that come through on the inhale and straight kush on the exhale. That's good enough for me. Now it's a great variety for all of the connoisseurs out there. If you haven't tried it, maybe you should give it a try because it's a banger. Now guys, in terms of pure quality, in-house genetics is right up there with the best. And for this reason, there are always counterfeits trying to copy their stuff and pass off fakes as real. The in-house genetics team is always improving their packaging to make it harder to counterfeit. Many packs come with barcodes that you can scan on your phone to prove authenticity. Don't get got guys, there are loads of scammers out there, even today, so always be careful. Now I'm not sponsored by in-house genetics, I just like growing that dang fire. Their packs usually go for around 250 to 350 bucks, and I literally pay it from all myself. I guess you can say I'm just a sucker for good genetics that produce beautiful frosty resin producing flowers that just look and taste excellent. Now links to all the products we use on this channel are in the description below so be sure to check it out. You can grab a discount on everything so definitely check that out and support the channel. Now a question we get a lot on this channel is what's the best way to pop your beans? As taproot has just begun to sprout out of the seed, successful germination. Well, for me, my answer always seems to change. Sometimes I go straight into the soil, especially with auto flowers, but for this run to get things started, I pop those beans into a glass of water with a dash of hydrogen peroxide, and I just set them in a dark place. Now the water and the excess humidity causes chemical reactions to occur within the seed, and before you know it, you've got a healthy seedling. Now for those who may not know, probably because you aren't subscribed to my channel, so definitely subscribe down below, it's not that hard, it takes a second. And you can learn about all my secrets just like hydrogen freaking peroxide, dude. That shit is where it's at. But hydrogen peroxide is a germination hack that you can use. Just add a dash to your water and this will help break down the outer shell and boost the germination rates. For more tips on how to germinate your seeds every single time, I'll put a link to a video up in the top card. Be sure to check that out. Now let's talk medium and setup. I'm a huge fan of soil and organic inputs. I pretty much just started these girls off in a mixture of peat moss and potting mix. For those who may not know, a basic definition of organic gardening is pretty much gardening without synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. But organic gardening is much more than simply just replacing man-made chemicals with those derived from natural sources. In an organically managed garden, the emphasis is on cultivating an ecosystem that sustains and nourishes plants, soil microbes, and beneficial insects rather than simply making plants grow. Creating this ecosystem begins with improving the soil and adding organic matter by mixing compost into the soil also increases capacity to retain water, nutrients, and supports beneficial microbes which are essential to healthy plant growth.
Now all that said, I didn't do much for the seedling stage beside let them grow. Any nutrients they needed came from within the seed itself and the medium that I used. I had them in my veg tent closet with a few other plants while our 4x4 finished up and got cleared out. The veg tent closet is pretty much just that, a closet converted into a veg chamber. I had a Mars Hydro SP3000 putting in work, only running at about 45% and I had an oscillating fan in there as well and I layered the walls with reflective insulation. To see just how I converted this closet into a grow chamber, check out our best budget setup video. We'll put a link in the card above. Now the seedlings grew into the veg stage at a pretty decent rate. We got them out of the seed starter pots and into some nursery pots so that they can spread their roots or their metaphorical wings and get high I guess. Maybe I'm just too blazed right now, but you get what I'm trying to say. Now people always ask what's the secret to healthy plants? Well it's simple, healthy roots. Often you can't see what happens below the soil so I try to make sure that I can do whatever I can to help the plant grow healthy strong roots. One thing I always use is mycorrhizal inoculants. Recently I've been using Dynomyco and it's friggin amazing. It's much more potent than other brands and a little goes a long way. Plus their dynamite packaging is super dope. Discount code ICANTHC420 works on Amazon and their official website. <laughs> so just in case you were wondering, that's my secret to healthy roots and happy plants, mycorrhizal inoculants. Now drop it in the comments if you can spell mycorrhizal without having to check Google first. Let me see who can really spell that shit. After a few more weeks, the plants are already ready to be transplanted out of their nursery pots. Now some of the avid viewers of this channel would know I recently moved. And I don't mean move from one house to another. I'm talking moving from one country to a whole nother country. For those of you who may have never moved before, moving house is hard, let alone moving country. I had to sell off all my grow equipment, pretty much every single thing I had, except for my two favorite grow lights, the Mars Hydro FC6500 and the Mars Hydro SB3000. So bearing that in mind, I knew I wouldn't be able to fetch these girls as long as I wanted them to because, well... I had a deadline to get everything down by. So before people ask, why did you flip to flower so early? Well, that's why. Now a pro tip for flowering your plants is transplant before you flip to flower. Not the day that you flip to flower guys, but before you flip to flower. If you're growing organically, now is a great time to amend the soil and add any organic inputs that you may need. Popular options are Gaia Green, Blood Meal, Bone Meal, man there are a lot of organic inputs that you can amend with. The main aim at this stage would be to provide the plant with the nutrients it needs during the flowering stage and enough to hopefully get it through the end of flower without having to top dress or feed any other liquid nutrients. Now this is where organic gardening can be a bit of a science. You aren't mixing synthetic fertilizers based on manufacturer specifications on the back of a bottle, you're really determining what organic inputs and what amounts to provide the nutrients you need. There is no one size that fits all answer to this, and you got to experiment based on your plant's size, age, medium, and a bunch of other factors. If you're running organics right now, you definitely know what I mean. This is why some growers choose to run DWC or synthetics, because it gives them greater control over their nutrients. But don't get hung up on this if you're just starting out. Just grow, and you'll find out what works best for you. Because I knew I'd have to flower these girls early, I started training from very young on this run. I used LSD clips to manipulate the plant and increase bud size, basically allowing me to increase my yield from a very small plant. Training is super important when it comes to maximizing your yield. I love using LSD clips, they make training so much easier. Bud Trainer has dope LSD clips and other LSD gear that you can use to improve your output with minimum input. Discount codes are in the description below, be sure to check them out. Now to trigger flowering of these girls, 
all I did was reduce the amount of light they get each day from 18 hours a day to 12 hours a day. The shorter light period mimics the shorter days and signals the plants that it's time to flower. No real science to it. Just change your timers and congratulations, you're now on flower time. Now some of you may think of this as the easy way out, but if I'm being completely honest guys, as the plants progressed, I did not need to do much at all besides monitor daily and water before the soil dried out too much. Now that's important when growing in organics. You don't want to let the soil dry out completely. That'll negatively affect the beneficial microorganisms in the rhizosphere below. What it's really about is striking that balance between too wet and too dry. When things get too wet, it can also attract pests like fungus gnats and even cause root rot. So the happy middle ground is super important. Now as the plants got even further through flower, things were looking super positive. Like I said, it was pretty much a hands-off approach other than just monitoring for any bugs or signs of deficiencies and watering before things dried out too much. Oh, and a couple of branches broke while I was training during veg, but it's okay, I taped it up and they made it straight through. At around week 2 or 3 of flower, I did decide to feed the plants a compost tea. Now I didn't see any noticeable deficiencies which called for emergency teas to be brewed, but I did know that dry organic inputs take a little while to break down and become available to the plants, so I just wanted to give the girls a little organic liquid nutrient boost, because like I say all the time on this channel, plants are able to uptake liquid nutrients a lot faster than dry nutrients. It's just accessible a lot quicker. Wait, have you even subscribed yet? Now fast forward to around week 4 or week 5 and the plants are starting to show their true colors. The flowers are beginning to form and the plants are completely finished the pre-flower stretch. Most of the plant's energy at this point is literally being focused on putting on bud size rather than growing more leaves or nodes. Now usually I do a light defoliation before and during flower but I didn't need to on this run. Again, there wasn't much to do besides monitor and water, like literally. These girls were an absolute pleasure up to this point. But guys, I got a question, do you grow organic or synthetic? Drop it in the comments down below and let us know. Now speaking of organic, lots of people say that the taste and smell is better when it comes to organics. Now this isn't scientifically proven as far as I'm aware, but I do know that it's week 7 right now and all I can say is shit. Got to say boys, the smell coming from the go tent is getting intense, almost to the point of freaking ridiculous bruv. Thankfully, I don't have any pesky neighbors to worry about, but either way, I know that my carbon filter system has me covered. Perfect! When it comes to the sugarcane, she was packing on frost at alarming rates. The frost even on the fan leaves was like a friggin' sight to see fam. No cap. What a beauty. She smelled nice and sweet with an after sniff of diesel. Her buds were not super fat, but boy were they frosty. I can definitely say fam hands down one of the frostiest strains I've ever grown. Some of her sugar leaves had so many trichomes on it, it was almost like a cardinal sin not to do something with the trim sugar leaves. They were literally just trichomes everywhere bruv. Drop a comment down below and let me know what you think of this frost. But that said, the dirty kush breath was no slouch guys, and definitely not to be overlooked. The dirty kush breath literally had something about it that I just couldn't put my finger on, but I absolutely loved it. It was a dank, smelly, gassy strain that smelled, well, like 
dirty cush breath, which in some twisted, gross, non-perverted way sounds and smells so friggin' good. The dirty cush breath definitely had a lot more color and variations than the sugar cane, which was predominantly green. Or maybe you can call it white because of all the trichomes on there. But the dirty cush breath had more purple hues and more dank cues. For me, there's no clear winner between the two. I'm usually a gas man myself, as you guys probably all know, but this sugar cane has such a dank after sniff of gas that I really can't say I like one over the other. Now do you prefer sweet, fruity terpenes and flavors, or do you prefer gassy, dank, that sort of thing? Drop a comment down below and let me know what's your preference. Now let's talk about the flowers. On the sugarcane, the flowers were a bit more cylindrical, slightly longer rather than fatter which, if I'm being honest, is completely fine with me. I've found that huge buds can be more easily prone to bud rot. Not that I don't like big bud, but you just gotta pay attention to your dry and cure a little bit more. But either way, as I keep saying, she was a freaking frost monster, guys. So I'm super happy and no complaints here. But when it came to the dirty cush breath, her flowers were definitely more circular and a bit more dense as well. A little more color and maybe even a little more bag appeal just because of that. But the sugar cane was so damn frosty, they honestly got their own appeal in their own little way. Now if I'm being real guys, I don't care about bag appeal as much as taste, terps and effects. I've seen some super pretty flowers that literally burned like crap and stuff that looked dark and not great but they taste and smell a fucking amazing. So don't always buy into the hype that's all about looks guys, cause it's not all about looks. Anyways, let's move on. We all know that everyone harvests at different times based on the effects that they're looking for. Some people eyeball their trichomes, others go by the pistols, some use USB microscopes for the most accuracy. Personally, I usually wait for the trichomes to be mainly cloudy with a little bit of amber before I chop. Now because everyone's got their preferences, my only suggestion would be don't harvest too early. Because in my experience, the flowers can really fatten up during the last couple of weeks or even days before you chop. You don't want to go and shortchange yourself the chance to get some nice buds just because you were too eager to chop. Now another popular question is flush, flush, flush. How long did you flush? Did you flush? When did you flush? When do you start flushing? Now guys, if you're wondering whether I flushed, I did a whole video on this. Be sure to check out that video, but in long story short, I did not flush for this run. I didn't do an ice flush or a dark period before harvest either. What I did do though was trim some of those excess and super large fan leaves right before I harvested. I didn't remove any of the sugar leaves because those act like little bud blankets and keep the flowers from drying out too fast. That just makes the trimming a little bit easier for me as well. I also aim for a long slow dry and cure. Now for this run I dried for about 12 days and cured for about a month. Again, because I was moving I had to enjoy the fruits of my labor before I left. So I didn't really have too much of a choice. Usually I do a full weigh in but I completely completely forgot on this run. So many things were just going on with the move guys and I literally just forgot. I'm so sorry. But all that said, the dry and cure is a process that can make or break your grow. Your perfect flowers can dry too quickly and lose their taste, their chirps and everything and they'll turn out like complete trash. There are ways to rehydrate your flowers, yes I know, but rehydrating your flower never brings it back to its original potency. That said, dry flower does suck for pressing rosin. So if you have some super dry flower, rehydrating is definitely a good idea if you want to press rosin. I've done a recent video on rehydrating your dry bud and also done a full and detailed video on my drying and curing process. Now those two videos are dope so definitely check them out.
Now, I just want to take a moment to especially shout out our patrons and our YouTube channel members. You guys are amazing and your support is appreciated so, so much. Now, if you want to join up, guys, there are loads of perks that you can get from Beans for a Whole Year on Patreon to dope custom emojis on YouTube. Definitely check it out, fam. There's something for everyone on there. Perfect. Now we've done a bunch of grow videos on this channel already but in this seed to harvest episode we really went in depth and tried to give you guys a full review of how we did things from start all the way to finish. As we move forward we'll be bringing you guys much more content, more epic seed to harvest and more dope ass knowledge to help you guys grow even better plants. Now a huge shout out to all the homies dropping fire seed to harvest like Homegrow TV, High Again, Basement Auto Flowers and many more growers out there. Definitely give these guys a follow and let's spread the love and the good vibes as we continue to grow together and help each other improve. Always remember, when someone says you can't, I can. THC. Perfect. Now please do smash the freaking like button down below, show your love and definitely check out these other two dope ass videos on screen right now. You won't be disappointed guys. Now much love homies, peace out and we'll see you on the next one.